Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. Etch a Sketch by Windy Tong, MD. You are only 17 when you first learn its meaning. Just moments before, you sit in a white-walled room with your mother by your side. You have been losing weight. You have been feeling dizzy. You have been bed-bound with colds. You have been waking up with the taste of blood, finding dried crimson on your pillow, and tiny red freckles smattering your skin. In the middle of the waiting, your mind drifts back to when you were younger, when the thing you liked best to play with was an etch-a-sketch. You would maneuver the knobs to draw linographic pictures with an invisible stylus, a whole world of possibility pixelated into a gray two-dimensional screen. If you made a mistake, no matter. The image would blur with a few simple shakes. If no one saw it, did it ever really exist? When the doctor returns, you try to brace yourself, but find your defenses dissolving as he delivers the message. This is the moment you learn the meaning of tragedy. It is a fortune-telling. It is a sentence. Your mother's face pales. You simply stare at the hands in your lap, hands that have just learned to love, hands that have fumbled to make art, hands that could not help but hold onto hope. A whole world of possibility suddenly goes dark. If only this screen could be shaken, this gritty image erased. As you watch your mother's tears fall, you retreat to a safer place inward where you are free to sketch the image of the two of you at the kitchen table just that morning before things changed. In a single movement, you pencil in the harsh slant of your angled cheekbone. In another, you etch worry lines into your mother's forehead for age to deepen. This is not the future that she dreamed for you. But there are things you cannot capture with two-dimensional strokes. What of the way the sun had hit the glass salt shaker? or the slowing of light, the way refraction had scattered rainbow flecks across your mother's cheeks like celestial confetti, the grace of an unseen angel, the way the coffee was still warm against your lips. These are the things you realize now that will sustain you. You reach for her hand, and she grasps back tightly. Hello and welcome to JCO's Cancer Stories, The Art of Oncology, which features essays and personal reflections from authors exploring their experience in the field of oncology. I'm your host, Dr. Lydia Shapira, Professor of Medicine at Stanford University. Today, we're joined by Dr. Wendy Tong, an internal medicine resident at Macaw Medical Center of Northwestern University. In this episode, we will be discussing her Art of Oncology poem, Etch a Sketch. At the time of this recording, our guest has no disclosures. Wendy, welcome to our podcast and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me today. So let's start by talking a little bit about your writing. You are going through your medical training, plus what writing does for you. I first started getting into writing poetry or writing in general about halfway through medical school. I was always inspired to write after a specific patient encounter, sort of as a way to capture something human that I had noticed about them, like a specific detail or mannerism or an attitude, something that I wanted to appreciate and to remember. When I started, poetry was sort of a good way to capture those little glimpses, separate from writing more of those like narrative type essays where you're able to get in more of the medical details and the history and the whole complex course. And so I've I found solace in being able to reflect on experiences both through both mediums, but I, I do find that it's a good way for me to, to process on how 
you know, patient encounters went or what a specific patient's meant to me. And it's a way for me to remember them as well. Let's talk a little bit more about poetry and how poetry, as you say, allows you to just get these glimpses or perhaps capture an emotion or a scene. Tell us a little bit more about that, that choice to tell the story in this particular case of a very moving scene through poetry. I can still remember the very first poem I attempted to write. It was in medical school. I was actually rotating on a palliative care elective and it was a very sick cancer patient. She was like very thin, cachectic. But the first thing I noticed when we walked in her room was she had these amazing nails, like glittery nails, long, and they were gold and they're beautiful. And so that's something I, I noticed and I commented on. And she said, it's what makes her feel human still and what still keeps her going, even though she's so sick. So that detail just stuck out in my mind. And after I left the room, I ended up typing up like a little blurb about this detail I'd noticed on my phone. And that ended up becoming like the first official poem I'd written about a patient. First poem in general, actually. When I'm able to be in the in the moment or in the present and notice things and observe things, I think that's sort of where the sometimes the inspiration strikes, so to speak. It's something human and something like a, some kind of connection that I'd I like to like reflect on and remember. And so I think that's what makes poetry so powerful and helpful in those ways. It's sometimes I don't have, let's say, a full story to tell, or I just want to capture this one moment and how it made me feel. And so I think poetry is really powerful in that way. You're making a very good case for narrative and medicine. And that is that it sort of all about observation and then sort of, as you say, capturing that whatever art form you use. And so my question now is a little bit about that creative energy that seems to be flowing from you that maybe starts in a moment of connection or in a moment where something just captures your imagination and then you express it. Tell us a little bit about how you've incorporated that into your life as a physician, maybe even starting as a medical student. You know, I'm going a little bit to the why do this? What does it do for you? That's a great question. I'm an only child. I grew up loving reading and being very into books. I, as a child, sometimes I would, my parents might come in and be like, why is your light still on? So I'd like block out the light from under my room because I'd be up all night reading. But when I was young, I wanted to be a writer. At the time, it was just maybe novels or whatnot. But the writing itch, I never really pursued it. Or I would take a creative writing class here and there, like in college. But never really found the subject material that made things click for me, so to speak. And I remember in my gap year before applying to medical school, learning about the field of narrative medicine, which is still ever growing and reading, you know, Atul Gawande's books, which are obviously nonfiction, but it just kind of opened up a whole new world for me in the sense of I can think about combining these two passions with writing and with medicine. So again, I don't think the inspiration really started or struck until having actual patient encounters. Like the first half of medical school was a lot of textbook learning and classroom. And it's not exactly inspired. <laughs> it was not until my medical, like my actual medicine rotations that having that human component and having those specific encounters were very inspiring, so to speak. I think it's one patient for me who made me decide to go into internal medicine. And also I later realized is inspiring me to want to become a palliative care physician, actually. And the first patient I started writing about is all the same patient. I was in my third year of medical school and on a general medicine rotation. The first patient I got grown very close to and who passed while I was helping take care of him. We are able as medical students to spend a lot more time with patients. So I remember in the early mornings when it was still dark out, I would go into his room while I was pre-rounding and, and chat with him. And he would tell me about how tired he was. He was quite sick. He had new pulmonary hypertension and high output heart failure and all these things. He had a chest tube in. And each morning as he, he would get worse and worse, he would just tell me about how bothersome like the beeping was, how much he hated needle sticks. and 
it was like a harbinger of what was to come because it seems like he knew what was going to happen because one morning he asked me about physician assisted suicide even and he asked things like why me and it was a very emotional time and I still think about it today that day like our team had gotten palliative involved he had wanted his code status changed to DNR and within 24 hours he had passed away I remember when I found out I burst into tears in the resident room and I just kept thinking about this patient and like looking back I think it was in those moments of connecting with him and with his wife and family that sort of I'm not a religious person but it almost feels like a spiritual or um, like a sacred feeling in the room sometimes when you're talking about life or death or sometimes you just get this feeling and I think that's the feeling that both makes me want to write and to, I think, pursue palliative care. I think that's a very beautiful, sincere, very authentic pitch for why it's really important to allow that space, right? The space of, you know, absorbing what just happened to sort of celebrate the connection, in your case, maybe even memorialize a patient. And I wonder if you find that the medical culture and, you know, your attendings are supportive of this or it's something that you sort of push to the side and, and keep private. Going back to that that day <laughs> when I burst into tears in that moment, some residents in the room or my residents were very supportive of me and told me to take care of myself and go home for the rest of the afternoon. Another resident, I think I overheard saying like, just just wonder what had happened. Totally normal reactions. The next morning, what I really appreciated was my senior resident and our attending had let us have a moment of silence before we started rounds. So we all stayed in the room. We reflected a little bit about what the patient meant to us and how that his clinical course had gone. And we were able to share a moment of silence, which I found really impactful that I was really appreciative of. And that's something I've also noticed on like my medicine rotations here or when we are in the ICU and having a lot of stuff happen my team and now I am I am the senior resident now but as an intern my senior residents would be quite supportive and I just think those moments of silence they're so simple to do and very quick to do but I think it's really impactful and it shows that people are aware of you know how hard this job can be sometimes and that patients who we lose do deserve that moment of respect. So whenever that happens, I'm very grateful for it. And it's something I hope I will do myself as a senior resident and in the future to just encourage, you know, everyone, it's okay to experience those emotions and it's okay to pause and reflect. And we don't always have to keep moving forward without pausing. Wendy, I'm very impressed hearing you talk about how you process the emotional intensity of some of these connections. I wonder if you've shared your poetry or your writing with patients. That's not something I've done before yet. <laughs> a lot of the poems I had written are of very sick patients. And oftentimes it's patients I happen to meet while I'm rotating on like a palliative care elective. I think it says something. One, it's just being able to have the time and the space to notice and sit with people and have those moments of connection and then to write them down and process it. What I'm hearing you say is that you're drawn to palliative medicine. And I wonder if that's because in that specialty, we value being with patients and accompanying them. How does that sound to you? That sounds totally right to me. <laughs> I think so much of what brings a lot of us into medicine is, you know, we say we want to help people. We enjoy speaking with patients and making those connections. And I will say, I have noticed that when I'm very busy, very burnt out and tired, I don't have that spark in me or the motivation or inspiration per se to want to write or to create. And so I think it, it says something that to be at our best and to be you know, emotionally well and be able to create, it, it's best if we are in a good mental space. But for me, when I think back about what made me drawn to medicine, again, um, it's to those moments. And I do think palliative as a specialty is is one that intentionally fosters those moments and, and gives us a little bit more time to do so. 
Wendy, can you help our readers and our listeners understand your poem a little bit more? For some people, reading poetry is like um, perhaps reading a foreign language. They're not as familiar. Tell us a little bit about this. Bring us to the bedside and what happened there. Usually the poems I'd write would be about specific patients that I've had and specific details about them. This is actually the first fictional poem, so-and-so, that I've written in the sense that it's about breaking bad news and it's written from an imagined perspective of a young leukemia patient hearing their diagnosis for the first time. So as clinicians, we do have to break bad news to patients, not infrequently, and though it's never easy. And of course, it's a skill that I'd hope to work on for quite a while. At some point, I do think we become immune to it, to the emotional heaviness of it. And we might forget or not fully realize what it means or what it truly feels like as the patient hearing bad news for the first time. Especially, I think, for younger patients, it's likely their first time hearing something that's often life-changing. So this poem is sort of a reminder, I think, for us as clinicians to try to stay mindful and empathetic and considerate when delivering bad news, no matter how many patients we've seen that day or how tired or burnt out we are, whatnot. In this poem's case, we don't know exactly what the doctor said, but maybe they could have delivered it differently. And, you know, you can say there, there's a balance between beating around the bush and delivering the message, but there's also nuances in how you deliver it. And in this poem, Wendy, you also bring out the delicate balance between the mother and the patient at a very tender age, right? So tell us a little bit about that. It's more nuanced than just about breaking bad news. It's how the news lands on mother-child and how they're responding to each other. Where did that idea come from? People are still living at home as teenagers and, you know, sometimes parents are still taking them to doctor's appointments. And I think it's important in general for patients to have loved ones nearby and as supports when they're at important visits or hearing bad news. And in this case, it's sort of a, I guess it's like a dual response. It's like the the patient is hearing the news, the mother, and you, they're also watching their loved one hear the news, but they are also a little distant from it because I think the news is quite shocking. And so they kind of have to retreat a little bit inside. And that's kind of what the last two stanzas are about. The lead up is the patient is kind of knows something is going on, but doesn't really know what it what it is. But actually hearing the words, the diagnosis, having that as a shock and having those words change their imagination of how their future was supposed to go. So the last two stanzas, sort of a reflection, the patient going to their safe place and thinking about the things that hold them together. And whether that is their relationship with their parents or their loved ones and who is their, who are their supports. Small things about like what I think makes life important to them or what makes life a good life to live. Yeah, finding meaning, right? Also in the experience and sort of crystallizing for themselves what their idea is of their own future, which has just been shattered probably by the news that was delivered, right? Does that sort of get it? I think so. I think so. And the poem doesn't go into prognosis or what life will look like. And, you know, oftentimes we know now, you know, depending on your type of leukemia, your cancer, your course can look drastically different based on what treatments are out there. But this poem was just trying to get at that initial delivery of the news and how this patient processes it and reaching for the support she has to to get her through it. So before we wrap up, I have two questions. And the first is very simple and may not have an answer yet. Does writing poetry make you a better doctor? I would like to think so. (laughs) I want to be in a space where I am thriving, ideally. I know residency, you know, with its ups and downs may not always be that place. But, you know, I hope to have a career where I feel fulfilled. And part of that also means, of course, doing what I love to do, but that also involves being inspired to write and to create. There is something there for me that I know I'm in a good headspace when I when I want to create. And the other piece of it, I do think writing poetry and writing in general just helps me pause and take things slower and 
the act of thinking about what had happened and writing and editing makes me more appreciative. And it does help me remember patients more, I believe. It's like the act of metabolism itself is helpful, I do think. And I hope it would make me a better physician and more observant and more empathetic. That's my hope. And tell me, Wendy, we can write, you know, to reflect, to process, but then the decision to publish and share with people you don't know is a whole different step. What made you decide that you wanted to share this with the world? When I was younger and trying to write things, whether it was, you know, short stories and like fictional creative work, I was always too scared to show anyone. (laughs) Writing, it feels quite vulnerable. And it's like, sometimes it's like the inner workings of my mind. And usually I'm a private person and, and like to protect that. But for me, when I read good poetry, It's simple language, but it's something about the choice of the words and their specific arrangement that makes me feel something. And when I feel a certain way after patient encounters, it makes me want to try to capture it and metabolize it and also kind of share that feeling with, you know, people I don't even know, per se. But I think for me, poetry is about conveying not necessarily a message always, but a feeling across and That feeling is one of the reasons that I wanted to go into medicine. And I I think it's going to be one of the feelings that will keep me going. And we sure hope that it does keep you going. Thank you on behalf of our readers for sharing your work with us. It takes the reader also to an emotional space. And I think that it's a gift that poets have for their readers, right? Because it allows the reader to sort of project onto their own emotional sort of space the feelings that they're having in response to your work. So thank you for that and keep writing. And until next time, thank you for listening to JCO's Cancer Stories, The Art of Oncology. Don't forget to give us a rating or review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find all of the ASCO shows at asco.org slash podcasts. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.